Good evening. Welcome. Very good to see such a, a full hall for this excellent discussion we're going to have tonight. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, editor of Prospect Magazine, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to this event. Really delighted to be chairing uh, tonight. Now, all the more as I read the book this week and to be able to introduce you to our distinguished guest speakers. John Micklethwaite, here, is the editor-in-chief of The Economist and after studying history at Magdalen College, Oxford, he worked as a banker at Chase Manhattan before joining The Economist as a finance correspondent in 1987. He was named an editor's editor by the British Society of Magazine Editors, a very um, uh, austere body, I can tell you, in 2010. Adrian Wald Waldridge is The Economist's management editor and writes the Schumpeter column. He was previously based in Washington, D.C. as the bureau chief there, where he also wrote the uh, very well-followed Lexington column. And together, they're the author of five previous acclaimed agenda-setting books, which, which emerge, I can tell you, if you're in the world of current affairs, emerge and, um, uh, without, um, without people knowing they're coming and make an enormous impact on their arrival. The Witch Doctors, A Future Perfect, The Company, The Right Nation, and God is back. Tonight they join us to share some of the thinking from their new work, The Fourth Revolution. In this book and in their talk, they talk about three great revolutions that they argue have taken place in the history of the nation state. And in each of these, they would say, Europe and America have set the example, have been the model. But we're now, they're going to put to you, in the middle of a fourth one, and it's not clear that Western values, democracy, free markets, liberalism, are going to win against the other models uh, that countries have of running themselves. It's one of the central debates at the moment of uh, whether democracy is going to hold its own against uh, its rivals and which political values are really going to triumph, if you like, in the 21st century. So without further ado, let's, let's kick off and please join me in welcoming John Micklethwaite, Adrian Waldridge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bronwyn, the, 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 the cult of editors. We have to stay together. Um, I would, I, I, we, will, we will talk about the book, and then we'll have questions, and then we'll, then we'll open it up. I think the clue to the book, or the main place to start, is in the subtitle, which is um, The Global Race to Reinvent the State. And our starting point is one which is almost sort of based around the idea of progress. We think the worst form of competition to be in is one where you don't really know you're in that competition. And that was what happened to, say, Encyclopedia Britannica, when you were sitting there worrying terribly about whether other reference books were going to be better than you, and suddenly you're taken apart by something like Wikipedia, which comes from com where you never expected it, or the British motorbike industry back in the 70s, not thinking at all about the Japanese. Why do we think that? Because when we look at government at the moment, or Western government, we think it's in roughly the same state, in a competition it doesn't quite know it's in. And if I look at the European elections last week, I look at the midterms coming up in America in November, I see the same thing, which I would describe as a version of discordant apathy. Prospect's written about this, we've written about this. And it is where voters are very, very angry, very, very cross with the politics that they have not just in terms of the approval ratings of politicians, three most popular politicians at the moment are outside Parliament. It's also to do with the parties. The Conservative Party used to have three million members. Now it's got 128,000. That was a business. It would be out of business. If you look at, it's not just that. It's also the sense that despite being very angry, very cross, nothing is going to change. Nothing is really going to alter, no matter what the voters do, no matter what politicians do. That is the kind of prevailing thoughts, actually on both sides of the Atlantic at the moment. And the reason why we wrote this book is to say that is wrong. It's wrong in, for a good reason and a bad reason. It's wrong, the sort of good reason, is that really if you look at history, as Bronwyn just said, Western government has kept on reinventing itself. It does change. It changes in really dramatic ways. The fact it hasn't really changed much for, we would argue, almost 100 years doesn't mean it's not going to revert to type and start changing again. 
And the second reason is technology. The second good reason is technology. If you really think that the wave of changes has gone all the way through the private sector, affected everything, most of all the media business, if you really think those changes are not going to hit the public sector, well, then I think you can justifiably say, well, look, none of this stuff is going to happen. But we think it is, would be extremely surprising if that did not happen. So that's the good reason why government will change. The bad reason is that actually, yes, this time the West is in a competition, competition to do with values, competition to do with democracy, because now, finally, Asia is back. Asia now has an alternative method of government, and Asia, remember, we will argue, at one time was miles ahead of us. And from their perspective, this is coming back, and so that introduces the three revolutions of Western government, which is the reason why we think the West climbed ahead. And here's Adrian. If you go back to the year 1600, I think only a madman would ever have predicted that the, that the Western Europe, that Europe would become the dominant power in the world. You might have thought it would be the Ottoman Empire or perhaps India, and you might well have thought it would have been China. In 1600, there were three cities in Europe that had populations of more than 300,000 people. That was the population of the forbidden city alone in Beijing. And many of those 300,000 people in Beijing were Mandarin civil servants selected from the whole of this huge country by objective merit-based examinations. It was an extraordinary system of government. And yet, over the next three or 400 years, the West pulls relentlessly ahead. And it pulls relentlessly ahead essentially because it has three great revolutions in government. The first revolution was a public order revolution. It was the revolution that was created by the rise of the nation state. We regard the great symbol, the great philosopher of this revolution, essentially as Thomas Hobbes, the author of Leviathan, because he said that the fundamental thing that the state must do is provide public order. And that is exactly what the nation state does over the next few hundred years. It gets rid of all these warring barons who've been tearing countries apart. It gets rid of uh, wars of religion by saying essentially that the, that the king should decide the religion of his people, creates public order. But it creates public order in a way that doesn't get rid of competition. You have order within states, but competition with it, between states um, for preeminence, diplomatic preeminence, military preeminence, trading preeminence. So in China, when they invent gunpowder, they use it to create fireworks. We use it to create wars. They may be more civilized than us, but we tended to dominate for the next few hundred years because of that. In China, uh, when they traded with other countries, the emperor got very upset about this, and he basically said to all the people who lived on the rich southern coast in the mid-16th century, you have to move 17 miles inland. We don't want you contaminated by these other people around the world. Europe, by contrast, trades uh, with the rest of the world, creates empires with the rest of the world. It's constant, all these countries are constantly competing with each other. So Brazil uh, is, is taken over by, by um, Portugal. Spain has its Latin American empire. And of course, Britain has a huge empire all around the world. Order within, competition between countries, external power. That's the first revolution, the public order revolution. The second revolution is the liberal revolution of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. This is a revolution that we tend to associate with France or with America, but the country that we find really intriguing in this period um, is Britain, partly because we're British, partly because Britain was the great global power of the time, it was the America of its time, um, but partly because what Britain does in this period has extraordinary resonance with the situation of the state today. Between 1815 and 18. 50, 1848, Britain essentially reduces taxation from about 80 million pounds a year to 60 million pounds a year, but it does that at the same time that it makes government smaller, more efficient, more accountable. It's providing schools, it's providing hospitals, it's providing roads, it's providing a sewerage system at a time when the population is actually growing by 50%. How does it pull off this extraordinary miracle? It does it partly by Gladstone said he went round government saving candle ends and cheese pairings for the good of the country. It's partly just by, by um, saving. But more importantly, it's by changing the nature of government. Government in the 18th century was essentially a system of sinecures, pensions, rent-seeking, 
for the ruling class, Micklethwaite's ancestors. And what it did was to rip out these sinecures and, uh, and this rent-seeking and say, you must compete on the basis of open competition to get jobs in the civil service, that government functions must be utilitarian, they must provide services for the people. Um, so you can focus government, contract the state, but also provide services for the people. That's a great revolution. It makes the state more efficient, more accountable, and more defensive of fundamental individual freedoms. In the late 19th century, however, you get two complaints about this, this what we call lean government liberalism. One is that it's not compassionate enough. You get Dickens talking about grad grind in hard times. You get John Stuart Mill, the great prophet of, uh, of libertarianism, saying that actually what does, what does open competition for the civil service mean if some people aren't getting enough education to become part of this competition? At the same time, you get a sort of national greatness critique of this view of government. People, the British are looking over at Germany and saying, wait a minute, Germany's got an activist state, a state that's building tariffs, a state that's building schools, a state that's building universities, and they're leaping ahead of Britain when it comes to the new technology of engineering uh, and chemicals, the new industries of the time. So there's a push towards a more activist state. And this lays the foundations for what we call our third revolution, which is the rise of the welfare activist state in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And just as the first revolution is associated with Hobbes, the second with Mill and the utilitarian liberals, the third is really driven by Sidney and particularly Beatrice Webb. They have this notion that the state can be compassionate and efficient, that it's better at running a country than the market. They create the Fabian Society, the London School of Economics, the New Statesman, to spread this doctrine of the state. They look at the huge industrial empires being created by Henry Ford in the United States through economies of scale and scope and division of labor and say we can apply exactly those same methods to the state. So the state begins to grow. You get the Great Depression and of course the great, uh, 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 as a result of that the building of uh, a bigger state. You get in, in, in Europe, in, in particularly in Britain, the New Jerusalem created by the Labour government after the Second World War. You get in America the Great Society. Again and again and again the argument that the state can make a better, more pleasant, more efficient society. And this argument really works in a fairly dramatic way. You get sustained economic growth. You get France celebrating its growth. You get Germany and this sort of miracle economy after the Second World War. You get Harold Macmillan saying you've never had it so good. Um, people whose parents never went to school or only went to school, to elementary school, get free places in universities. You get this huge expansion of the public sector which provides good, stable jobs for a growing population. Everything looks wonderful. And then, in the 1970s, things begin to go wrong. You get stagflation, so you're spending money but you're not getting much result as, uh, much out of it. You get the war on poverty and it seems that poverty wins. You get violence growing in the inner cities in the United States. In Britain you have the great question of who rules Britain because you've got interest groups, particularly trade unions, which keep subverting government and keep grabbing more power for themselves. Inflation, crime, stagnation, and you get a general sense of sort of moral degradation, moral decline. And I think the worst point in this great moral decline of the 70s took place in a sauna in San Francisco. And it involved two boys who just finished their high school education and two elderly men. John was one of those boys and he's going to tell you what he did with the two men. <laughs> the, um, it's true, I was, I was on my gap year, as they say, and I was um, traveling around America and I went to go and stay. The person I was traveling with is now a, a general in the British Army and we went to go and stay with a cousin of his um, who was living in an apartment block in San Francisco. He was a rich British guy, he made a lot of money and escaped taxes and gone to San Francisco. And he persuaded us to go and have a sauna with his friend Milton who lived not uncoincidentally right next door to him. And we sat there in the sauna and Milton asked us questions like, you know, who was Margaret Thatcher? She'd just been elected. Did we know her? He knew her. Um, he started depicting this slightly strange world where British Rail was going to be privatised, where British Leyland, the big old car company, was going to be broken up, sold off, where monetarism, this weird thing that I didn't really understand, was going to happen, where we were all going to end up with education vouchers. 
And I sort of sat there amongst the steam and thought, this is completely mad. It was sort of deeply hallucinogenic. On the same trip, I went to go and watch The Grateful Dead. And this was like the equivalent of that, only somewhat madder and completely unlikely. I'd just come from a boarding school in Yorkshire where we'd had to be taught by candlelight sometimes because of the miners. Well, the man in the case, though, was Milton Friedman. And the world which he depicted, and which him and Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan did, that, that was a kind of half-revolution back against the world that Adrian depicted. Because Reagan and Thatcher did change some things. They changed the idea that the state should run business. Thatcher did a huge amount of that. And just like all the other revolutions Adrian's just talked about, it, it, these were things from Britain which went all the way around the world. Go to Eastern Europe, go to Latin America. You'll see still the effects of what she did. They also changed the debate. It's very hard now to just stand there and say your answer to something is more government. There might be a case where you can say uh, government helps in this way, but the general philosophy, the sort of things that Lyndon Johnson said, the sort of things that the new Jerusalem was about, Ed Miliband won't say that. Even Francois Hollande won't go that far. Certainly Barack Obama won't. So they won a kind of debate, but they lost a big chunk of the reality. Margaret Thatcher spent 10 years desperately trying to tame the state. And she did do an amazing thing. She reduced welfare spending from 22.9% of GDP all the way down to 22.2%. <laughs> the numbers of the state, and it's still true, the one consistent of all our lives is the state has kept on growing and growing and growing. And that has been the reality of the Western state pretty much all the time since the, since the webs. And it's not just a matter of proportions of GDP, it's regulations. Adrian mentioned the webs. Sidney Webb was the son of a hairdresser. He would have been shocked if he went to Florida today and discovered that you need to spend two years in order to get a license to be a hairdresser, um, or another two years to become an interior designer. Whatever Leviathan was meant to do, it wasn't there to stop us having clashing color schemes in our sitting rooms. You go to the flat near where George Orwell wrote 1984, or where he wrote 1984. Around that, I think there's 32 different security cameras. The state is much more intrusive than any of us, and it's kept on getting more intrusive. And the reason is us, because it's not just the left. The left asks for hospitals and schools. The right asks for prisons, more military spending. And the wave of regulation that we deal with is just as likely to come from the right. It's just as likely to be the Daily Mail saying, something must be done, as it is from the Guardian. And the reason really is us. We are, we are like Augustus Gloop, the boy in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, who just wanted more and more and more. But in the end, like with Augustus, um, it had to stop. And that's not a bad place to introduce Adrian. <laughs> Why do we believe that we're actually at the beginning of a fourth revolution? Many people have argued that we're going to see revolutions in the nature of government and the state in recent years. Um, Bill Clinton had Al Gore running his reinventing government commission. Not that much came of that. But we actually do believe that things are going to change, and indeed things have already started to change. First of all, because the age of more, the age of ever more, has now come to a shuddering end. Um, we've had since 2007 governments borrowing $16 trillion dollars. Um, uh, in order to get us out of the hole that was, was, was dug in the recession. But I don't think this sort of deficit financing is going to go on for much longer for many reasons. One is that we've got into the habit of running a deficit perpetually. Keynes said that you should run deficits to prevent recessions from turning into depressions. You should do it as a sort of medicine that you only take at a time of illness. We've got into the habit of doing this all the time, and the effect of all this spending has, has, in many ways, diminished. It's become a medicine that doesn't work anymore. More importantly, we see the population aging. We see the baby boom generation beginning to retire. In Europe, this aging is going to change the structure of the population, so that there's going to be a, a significantly larger old group of people being supported by a significantly smaller, younger group of people. The same will happen in America, not to the same degree, but it will certainly happen. So that's really putting an end in the long term to this perpetual deficit financing. Um, secondly, I think there are really positive reasons for thinking that the state can improve. Partly that better management can improve dramatically the state. The state in many ways still continues to act as though it lives in the agricultural era. Why is it that we get these huge long holidays in the summer during which our children 
forget everything they've learned over the previous year. It's because they're expected to go out and help with the farming, with, with bringing in the harvest. That no longer happens in most parts of, uh, of, of Hampshire where I live. Um, it's partly that the state lives in the Fordist age in, of, of the Industrial Revolution, of huge integrated companies that own absolutely everything they, they, they do from top to bottom. The state continues to operate in that way. But just as in the private sector, you've had a revolution based on contracting out, measurements, best practices spreading very quickly. You're going to get that running through the, through the private sector, through the public sector, and improving dramatically the performance of the, of the public sector. But uh, most importantly, I think we're going to see an IT revolution. We are seeing an IT revolution which will revolutionize the public sector. If you think back to the 19th century, you had uh, a machine revolution which dramatically improved productivity in the, in, in the manufacturing sector. Or in the 18th century, it used to be the case that 98% of the population worked on the land. Now 2% of the population work on the land. I think IT is going to do the same for the service sector uh, that these two previous revolutions did for the manufacturing and agricultural sector radically improve productivity. And if you think about the state, the state is basically a collection of service sectors that can be changed. If you look at education, we can now use um, distance learning, we can use the internet, we can use all sorts of artificial intelligence to improve the way that we teach, to get, the, get, to get excellent first-rate teachers to, to teach to a much broader audience. You can use sensors, virtual consultations with doctors to make medicine a much less labor-intensive process, even if you think that the very core of the state, the ancient, the most labor-intensive thing that the state ever did, which is to fight wars, it's one of the reasons why states first existed, we're now applying to the army, um, drones, satellite technology, ro robots, I think the US Army now employs 12,000 robots of various sorts, so this internet technology, high technology, artificial intelligence, robots are going to transform uh, this very labor-intensive sector. A lot of people say to us, well, if you do this, if you apply these revolutions, you're going to harm the poor. Well, we say, actually, the state does a huge amount, actually, to subsidize the rich through crony capitalism or the very well-off through mortgage subsidies. There's lots of things that you can rip out uh, and take away, just as we did in the 19th century, that don't harm the poor, actually just take resources that we're giving to the rich. People say that this is impossible, it's a fantasy, nobody will ever translate this into practice because politics always resists this sort of change. Look at what happened to Sweden. From 1945 to 1993, the Swedish state got bigger and bigger and bigger. In 1993, it absorbed 67% of GDP. Top ta tax rates were 98% of the economy. Then, at that time, they suddenly said, actually, we can't go on making government bigger. So they reduced the size of the state. It's now 49% of GDP. They balanced the budget, they looked at their entitlement programs, and they said, actually, we need to change the way we have retirement, we need to link retirement to age and to, uh, and to the aging of the population. So they got their retirement system into balance, and they said, we need to improve productivity in the state sector. So they gave everybody, effectively, a voucher, so they have a universal voucher system. They allowed private companies to run schools and hospitals. They created a world in which welfare entrepreneurs could transform the public sector. So you can improve the state. You can apply technology to the state which will improve productivity. There are examples of this already happening which are changing the nature of countries. But finally, there is one pressure which is going to change all of this and which gives added urgency to, to, to the process, and that is global competition. The, the West has had the state, state-making, to itself since the time of, at least since the time of Hobbes. Now there are new people in the arena. John. We're very fin quick and finish. The, the, we'll finish where the book begins, which is um, with a place just in the outskirts of Shanghai, but Pudong, um, and what we call the China Executive Leadership Academy. And this is a place you approach. It's got sort of um, barbed wire around the outside. It feels very military. You come up to the main bit, and suddenly it feels as if you're inside a university. It's sort of like Harvard, but Harvard as redesigned by Dr. No. And in the middle, there is a huge red scarlet building, like a desk. And that is the main headquarters, and there's an inkwell, and there are lots of brown dormitories around the outside. And then this, fundamentally, is a place where the Chinese send their, what the locals call the cadres, to, 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 to learn about government. And it's for the senior people in China, the people who are going to be ambassadors, the people who are going to run state-owned companies, people are going to run provinces. 
And it's not like the party school in Beijing. They go there in order to find out where government works best. And so they get sent out from there. They get sent to Iceland to go and look at pensions. They go to Chile to go and look at what it's doing to social services. They come to London sometimes. They virtually never go to Washington. They go to individual American states. They go to Scandinavia a lot. But if you want a place they particularly go to, they go to Singapore. Why? Partly because they like the authoritarian angle of Singapore, but also because... It's, it's, rather, it's, it's not a stupid thing to do. You know, Singapore delivers roughly twice as good services as we have here for half the cost. Maybe very small, but it does it much more cheaply. And it does it by really thinking about government. Yes, there's a degree of kind of Asian value stuff and a degree of um, authoritarian, but the real core of it is it takes government seriously. It pays people at the top of its civil service $2 million a year. It gets hold of, pays teachers more, but gets rid of bad ones. It thinks really hard about how to push itself up different ratings in a way that we haven't even begun to. It is not necessarily a model for everyone, but what is interesting is that China is out there. It is thinking about how to do these things. We are not saying that China in any way is the answer, but what we are saying is that there is a big battle going on. There's a big battle which has just begun about what exactly the state is for. Because that is the question that Hobbes asked, that Mill asked, the Webbs asked, Milton Friedman, even in Hatch Thorner. What is the state for? And that is a question which the West has ignored and which now again we think it must come back to. Not least because now there is a challenge from somewhere else and there is a debate. And democracy, we very, very much hope, triumphs in it. And I'll turn it over to Bronwyn. Well done, and uh, beautifully choreographed between the two of you, if I might <laughs> say so. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions to start off, and then we'll turn it out to questions. I know there will be um, a, lot of, a lot of those. You've described this great battle, and yet the way you've described democracy, it's actually not very, 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 very robust, it seems. It, it, you say at one point, I think it's digging its own grave. You've described how people like voting for things like welfare states that make them more comfortable and this is sort of accretion of the welfare state since the Second World War. And yet, you've also described, Adrian, particularly, uh, this, this whole bargain that people thought they had with their governments since the Second World War of health and education and pensions and so on, it's all being ripped up and rewritten um, because of debt and aging populations. And so you come to the question of what people are really going to vote for, for that. And, 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 you know, the way you've described it beautifully in the book and here, um, that it gives uh, democracy a bit of a, a short... Uh, shelf life, a, a fragility, can it actually solve the problems that it creates? I think democracy definitely can. I mean, it has all the power within it, but we should not exaggerate. You, you, the, the key in this thing is to be aware of the alternatives and also to be aware of the true history of democracy. I mean, the, the, there's a great quote from John Adam, one of America's founding fathers, which says, you know, I never saw a democracy that didn't commit suicide. And that's only in 1814, but, and that might seem weird, but from his point of view, democracy was a brief idea that happened in ancient Athens, was killed in 328 BC when the Macedonians defeated the Athenians, and then went with the great and honourable exception of one or two Swiss cantons for years and years and years. At his time, the French Revolution, you had a variety of things going wrong. And since then, democracy, democracy did very well at the end of the 20th century. It's had a very, not very good decade since. You know, actually, the number of democracies have gone backwards. Political freedom has gone back in the first half of things. So I think we should be... We have a general presumption in the West that democracy is just inevitable, and yet we're fed up with our democracies. There's, there's going to be progression towards it. I, 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 our view, generally, is that you clean up democracy. You get rid of the things which are tawdry and stupid about it, and, you, and, 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 it, and it works better. Democracy, on the whole, is still the best system, and, and there, are, there are a lot of problems within China which we detail in the book. But it, the difference now is that there is a, there is a challenge. Well, there is a challenge in, in, in this, these other models that are out there, as you said. But, I mean, Adrian, you were describing particularly the, 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 um, the creation of the welfare state, uh, the lib deliberate creation, and then how it swelled. And do you think democracy in the West is at a particular point of crisis now? Because politicians are having to say to people, actually, you're not going to get what you... 
I think if you look well, at the, 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 the relative appeal, the relative merits of authoritarianism versus democracy, it was quite clear when Fukuyama wrote his book that democracy was winning and authoritarianism looked doomed. And what, what his book, the, 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 on the end of history in the early 1990s, what we've seen over the last 20 years is democracy looking weaker. So you've had a retreat in the number of democracies over the last decade and authoritarianism in the Chinese variety looking stronger. And what the Chinese have done is something that's very remarkable, that most autocracies fail because um, dictators hold on to power forever and um, they get older and madder, essentially. And what they've done in China is to create a rotating autocracy. So you get your 10 years at the top of the party system, then you're replaced by another set of people. And they've, this, this transition of power has been very smooth. So it's a sort of, sort of uh, they have circulation of, of, of elites, they have meritocratic selection. So the challenge to our system is greater. How do we deal with that? I think what we have to do is um, deal with the over-promising, the over-expansion of the welfare state. We have to focus the state much more on what it should do, what it can do, rather than promising too much in order to save liberalism, in order to save democracy. Is it possible to do that, to get some sort of consensus when voters tend to be like gloop and, 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 and want more? Well, there are examples of this happening. I think one example, I quoted, but I'll quote it again, is what happened in Sweden, 67% to 49% of GDP, plus a balancing of entitlements in the long term. That's a big change of direction. I think it's important because, because that's happened, and that's had a, a, an effect around the rest of the Scandinavian region. I also think what happened as a, after the financial crisis in Britain is quite interesting because when Cameron said um, we're going to have to have a period of austerity, we're not going to have to pay each other more, more, more than we're earning, the voters basically said yes. And they certainly said yes enough to make the, 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 the Labour Party realise that it couldn't just promise more and more and more because people realised you have debt. I think that if you appeal to the best instincts of people, the better angels of their nature, they'll, they'll break with this system in the past whereby essentially what we were doing was robbing future generations in order to stuff our own faces. Hmm. Uh, beautifully put. Um, thanks, and I, I um, by which I mean I in fact agree with it. And um, you might add Germany to that, that list yes, in a sense. I've been asked to, 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 bail out, yes. to, to bail out the Mediterranean. John, you said at the end, look, I, you want the West to triumph. And that certainly seems to be the uh, the, 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 the guiding um, spirit of The Economist, if one asks the rather sardonic question, how do you run a country these days? The Economist answers it with, run it like a Western one, with democracy, uh, free markets, um, uh, a, a belief in liberty. Um, but why do you think those values should win? Is it because they make people uh, richer or happier? Or do you think liberty is a, a good in itself? Why, why, why should... Think, Why should we win? I think liberty is more of a good in itself than, than we have tended to realise. And I think if you look back at that great revolution of the 19th century, when, as we said, you know, Britain powered ahead of the rest of the world, uh, liberty was a huge deal for them. And, and you look at people like Mill and you look at the original liberals, and what's fascinating is not just their kind of stinginess, the, the, the Gladstonian hanging on to the cheese pairings and things, is that actually they went to quite... They, they, they were two things. They were quite frightened of democracy in some ways. They worried about individual liberty being compromised by the by the will of many, but also they they, they pushed themselves quite hard even on things like terrorism. Their equivalent of it, which was a lot of um, very radical people coming from Europe, they, they said, you know, we're not going to open their mail, even though they could start throwing bombs. We're not going to do things like that because we think that's against individual liberty. And actually, even when you look at debates like privacy at the moment, I think we have forgotten about liberty. But the, and Adrian went to university with Isaiah Berlin. You, you look at a lot of Isaiah Berlin's he warnings. He's a tiny bit older than Adrian, arguably slightly cleverer. Uh, and he, uh, he, 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 but he issued these warnings continually, saying we are giving away liberty. And, 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 and I think within that balance, we've gone too far. So, yeah, the, I, I think that is, a, that is a big deal. It's not something that we should just take for granted. Let's, let, let, let's go to questions more widely. <coughs> I'm interested in how you write a book about a perfectly balanced battle with this constant battle with, between the two authors. Um, uh, let's, let's go here, here in the front, man in the, the pink shirt. Um, you frequently stated Sweden as your uh, model for the change that is needed. This is a question, a genuine question from me. I don't know. 
Was there a consensus in Sweden that such change was necessary before it could be effected? And if so, does that mean that it needs it here first before it can be changed here? I think what they had in Sweden was um, a sense they had a crisis. Um, and the, the, the crisis was so severe that it really shook them up. Um, they had a consensus, I think, that they'd reached the limits of big government, that 67% and taxes that were going up to the whole of people's income was too much. So there was that sort of consensus they couldn't go on getting bigger. You know, you come to a point you can't go on getting bigger. But there was also a group of people who had worked out, partly based on Mrs. Thatcher's uh, revolution, partly based on what was going on in the United States, they had worked out a program of changes that they wanted. And these changes combined a sense of introducing markets into, this, uh, into the system, a sense of prudence, um, which was to, to bring long-term entitlements under control. And that appealed to, I think, the, 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 you know, the good housekeeping nature of the, uh, uh, of the people in general. Um, but also they had a sense that the state was very paternalistic. It looked down on people, it tried to control people. So there was a sense of empowering people, of giving people more choice, which again, I think, appealed to a broad group of people. And when you, in a country like this, it's very consensus oriented. And when it changes, it tends to change in a big way and then get, get stuck with that change. But I went to an extraordinary sort of, every year they have in Sweden a sort of, uh, a sort of summer camp for politicians, for the political classes in, in, in Visby. And they all go there and they sort of take off their party hats. They don't, um, they don't act in a sort of antagonistic party pre sort of rah-rah thing that you see in the House of Commons. They all sit down together. They go jogging together. They probably do other things in saunas together. But they sit down and they talk about the big issues, you know, demographic threats, entitlement threats, um, debt, and things like that. Also, the impact that, that IT is going to have on the, the country. And it's a very consensus, but serious sort of sense of what you do. They also have, I think, a very long-term sense of trust in each other and in institutions. And one of the problems with translating this revolution, I think particularly in the United States, is that trust in institutions and in individuals is very low. So that, that, that's a huge problem. And it's very different between countries. I mean, I'm very struck by it. You, you, you've written it as if um, a, a country can look up and say, well, I have a bit of that. Like, I have a bit of Singapore. But actually, these things are very deeply culturally rooted. We might come back to that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, man in the hat. And people start to... Hey there. Uh, you can't have a democracy if you privatise the state because you deny the tools of power to, from the people. A uh, privatised system, and therefore uh, uh, to use the word democracy in a privatised state is a lie and a, and a great disservice to everybody in that country, unless, of course, you're part of the elite. Thank you. Do you, do you, do you think that France is, a, is, a, is, is an example of that? I, I think that uh, if, you the, <clears throat> if you rob the people of the power to run their own uh, trains and energy and it? schools, then you rob those people of any tool of freedom but we're and very, democracy. We're, 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 mm. we're, I suppose I was asking the question rhetorically because what, what happens in the rest of a lot of Europe is that when, when you say privatised, what we mean is you still have, public, you have the public service, but all that's happening is it isn't being delivered. You're still getting it free, which is what happens. The French have very good hospitals, but a lot of them are delivered by companies. In Sweden, far more socialist than we are, they just took the simple rational decision that they would rather have the best hospitals, the best schools they could get, which means you have to, virtually every kind of system, it, they can be state ones, they can be very good state ones, they can also be very good non-profit ones, or they can be very good, um, they could be very good private sector ones, and you open them all up. And to us, the odd thing is to say, no, I don't want to do that, because in the end, and this I think is the great problem for the left generally in this particular thing. This book has a big problem for the right, which is saying you must take the state seriously. If you want to have a smaller state, you're going to have to really concentrate on doing it better. And also you're going to have to deal a lot with all the crony capitalism you have, which probably does come into things about who you award contracts to. But the problem for the left is really simple. is Do you care about the poor? Do you care about who actually these services are aimed at? Or do you care about the public sector unions who deliver them? And that is the problem for people like Ed Miliband. It's a problem for Francois Hollande. It's a problem for Hillary Clinton. You can see a wrestling with it at the moment. You know, the American schools could be a lot better. 
but they have very, very strong teachers' unions. See, the, 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 the real question is not, to me, whether the, the services are delivered by the private sector or the public sector or the voluntary sector, um, so long as they're delivered free at the point of delivery. The real question is having the mechanism of competition. So instead of having monopoly providers, you have competition, regular competitions for who can get that contract. So if the contract goes to a private company or to a, a public organization or to a voluntary organization, so long as it's a free and fair competition, that strikes me as extremely democratic. Also, at the same time, we believe that it's important to empower consumers, uh, for example, in education, to make broader choices about where they send their children to to school, so you know, we would say devolve and involve individual citizens as much as possible in decision making within the context of um, a disciplined government. Yeah. Thanks, I'm not gonna bring you back in. Um, I'm all for debate, but um, you've got a chance to uh, uh, throw that question at them when they're signing books outside. Woman at the back and then a gentleman over there. How do you square your sense of the fourth revolution and the aspiration that people will behave better um, to one another with the recent um, electoral gains of Marie Le Pen, UKIP, and others in the EU? I think basically it's what I said at the beginning. It's the, um, it's a lot of that is frustration. Um, it is that sense that they think things won't change, and so they're always trying to look for... For, 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 for radical alternatives, or they're trying, they're, it's the howl of rage. Um, I think I use the word discordant apathy. And actually, you can see it all the way around. It's not just Europe, it's the West. You see the number of coalition governments everywhere going up. You see membership of political parties. And I think it is, you know, yes, there are other themes going on. There's an anti-immigration thing. But there's a fundamental lack of trust in politicians to get things going. And that, in a sense, is what we're trying to answer. I mean, Jean, uh, Mr. Juncker, the man who could yet be president of the commission, did say one really clever thing, amazingly, which was, he said, you know, we as politicians, we know what we should do, we just don't know how to get elected if we did it. And to some extent, what we're doing is saying that y y you should go for it, there is, there is a change. And a lot of it, just one last point, is it goes back to this idea that we have overburdened the state. You know, we have given it the right to say you should, do, you know, decide whether we can cut hair, decide all these other things. By putting ever more obligations on it, we've made it not work very well, which makes people more annoyed because their schools and hospitals aren't as good as they should be, which therefore makes them more angry, which increases the whole cycle. That would be my answer. And Juncker, of course, lived up to his own maxim by getting re-elected for 19 years because he did very little. Right, um, gentlemen here. I agree with all of your philosophical points. But can I raise a major worldwide problem, and that is immigration. In the United States, there are now 51 million Hispanics, 14 million of which came in illegally, and we have enormous numbers of foreign workers. How does the sort of free enterprise government which you talk about handle a problem like that? I can answer. Um, the, the I think within that, that's a sort of policy decision. It's not, I don't think that really ties in the revolution we're saying, but if you want my own personal answer, I think on the whole, having the, the, the immigrants are what drive the world. You just need a, 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 the reason why America is doing so well, or has done so well, is because of immigrants coming in. And I dispute your numbers slightly on it, but as a paper, The Economist, we generally supported immigration. Certainly the, the, the most of the, every, actually every study of immigration shows the gains to society from having it. And as Adrian said earlier, in terms of the demographic problems in continental Europe, that, that, that is going to be a major deal. It's a lack of immigrants. But it is, again, I think it factors into this idea of rage against government. Um, but it's not, I don't see it as part of this sort of big structural shift about what exactly government should do. But um, it's, 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 it's another sign of just general fury with government. Um, should we go? It's, it's go in the front. And then I'm coming over this side. Thanks. Uh, are we not in danger of uh, falling into a kind of technological determinist view uh, that technology will save us and shrink the state? And isn't the, our recent experience actually that it does the opposite, that technology uh, projects in the public sector often fail, cost a lot of money, and that the government is phenomenally bad at being a smart customer as well? 
I think that we, you have to be very careful about technological determinism. And this book is not a sort of, um, is, is, is not just primarily a sort of managerialist book. It doesn't say that all we need to do is to manage the state better through technology and all of our problems will be solved. It also says that you have to make big philosophically determined decisions about what the state should do. Um, what is the state for? Uh, and we believe that um, it should do less and we believe that because of uh, philosophical arguments about liberty. We're just as hard on the right uh, about issues of individual freedom. We're very worried about the huge explosion of the national security uh, intelligence and surveillance apparatus as we are about crony capitalism and things like that. So it's not just a technological thing. However, as I said, I do think there is an IT revolution, a technological revolution going on, which is as significant as the manufacturing or the agricultural revolutions, and which mean you can do more with less. There is William Beaumol, Beaumol's disease. William Beaumol argued fundamentally that you can never get really big productivity improvements in the, pro in, in the, public, in, in the service sector, which the public sector um, is dominated by, because um, in order to have a string quartet, by Beethoven, you need four people to play it, just as you did in Beethoven's time. And I think that's fundamentally wrong, except in the trite sense, obviously it's true, because now you can listen to a string quartet with incredible quality um, sitting at home. You don't have to tolerate the coughing or the other annoying behavior of the person sitting next to you at the, uh, at the concert hall. Indeed, you can listen to all of the music ever produced in the, in the history of the world for a very reasonable fee to Spotify or somebody like that. So I think this sort of technological revolution, which allows human creativity to be reproduced and expressed, must surely change the way that the health service works, must surely change the way that education works, and must surely ultimately reduce the labor intensity of a lot of those services. So it can actually improve quality whilst reducing labor intensity. I remember when I was at Oxford, I went to a lecture delivered by an elderly medieval historian. And he would read from these yellowing notes that he had, which he presumably gathered together when he was a, uh, an undergraduate. He'd read, read, uh, read out each sentence, cough after each sentence. And after an hour of this torture, because he'd been putting each page behind the page before, he started again. <laughs> now, uh, that was a pointless thing to have happened then, but now you can, you, you can have you know, Isaiah Berlin projected in some way into, into your living room, in, on, 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 onto the stage in front of you. You can get a very good quality of reproduction, and the quality of reproduction of the human lecturer will be better in five or ten years from now. I think it would be foolish not to recognize that there is an amazing revolution going on which will change the, the service sector, the public sector. Um, and we need to harness that, that, that creativity uh, and use it, you know, not just to displace workers, but to make sure that workers can give of their best, uh, you know, that, they, that, that they're actually helping children to learn rather than just talk and chalk, re reproducing um, information. Thanks. Let's go here and then, is there a woman on behind? Okay, fine, then I'll go to the, the woman in blue then. Um, do you feel that since the collapse of the British Empire that I know we've sort of talked about immigration but my question is about multiculturalism in the sense that now we have um, second and third generation people from all across the world in Britain and Europe and in America is that has the lack of integration of these people and the lack of them being recognized as citizens of that state Hold, held um, the governments in question. Has that in itself had a big impact on people losing faith in government? I, I still don't really think that's the kind of core of it. I, do, I, th I think there is an element which is quite interesting in some places, and California is a very good example. You could argue the city of London is another example, where there is a danger actually more at the top end than the bottom of what we call a succession of the successful. And you can definitely see, I just come back from California, you can see this around Silicon Valley. You can see some of the brightest, most inventive people in the world really not that interested in their government. They, they're not, they, they tend to think of themselves as citizens of the world. And they think, well, I don't use government. They, they, they'll endlessly tell you, I, you know, I, go, I send my children to private school, I keep out of this, I try to have as little possible to do a government. And the answer is, yeah, they're using, 
the government build the roads they drive along. Um, they, they, there, there is an element of that, but there, it's, that, it's a mentality, I think, particularly at the top, that is new. I think at the bottom, the, the coming and going of immigrants, it's, it's, it's always been there. And the, again, I think like, possibly a better answer to the previous gentleman's question is when, what you're seeing a lot with immig immigration and the problems about that is the problems of a state unable to cope, you know, a state on which we have kept on pushing more and more and more stuff and native-born people get very cross when they think that out of the things that the state is doing well, more of them are going to, towards, towards immigrants. So I don't, I, think the, I don't really see, I see immigration as a symptom or anger about the immigration as a symptom of this rather than anything, a kind of causal factor. I've heard it said, I've heard it said that um, one of the reasons that democracy, that the franchise increased, was that increasing groups got economic power. So we had the merchant classes having power and therefore needing to be included in government, and then the working classes getting power through factories and needing to be included in government. And is, it, is there a danger that the flip side of this technological revolution is that increasing numbers of people become superfluous, that uh, because technology replaces so many people, we get a growing class of people who don't have economic power, who are economically disenfranchised, and therefore are in danger of becoming politically disenfranchised, and that that might be a force away from democracy and in the other direction? Well, I think that's an extremely good question. I mean, I think it is definitely the case that you are seeing a sense of disillusionment um, with government right across the, 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 the Western world in a sense that your voting doesn't matter, it doesn't produce any results. Um, but I think that that can also be explained in terms of the state offering too much, promising too much, and failing to, 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 to deliver on its promises. So I think, paradoxically, that one of the ways of re-legitimizing the state and re-enthusing people about uh, the government in general is to make realistic promises, promise a little less, focus on things that you can and, and, and should do. That's one, one part of it. But also, at the same time, and I think it's very important to do this, is devolve and involve as much as possible, devolve as, many, as much decision making to the lowest level possible and to involve people in making decisions. We're very, very keen on the um, parliament in Westminster doing less, local government doing more, elected mayors uh, doing more, precisely because people do feel that decisions are being made very far away from their own lives. We also think that you know, voluntary organizations taking more power over, uh, over decisions is a good way of involving parents, uh, of, of, uh, of involving people, giving, giving more consumer power over decisions through vouchers or the rest of it is a good way of involve, uh, involving people. So it is definitely the case that disenfranchisement is a worry. As on the technology front, it's a very complicated argument, it's a very difficult argument. We've had it on the, the cover of The Economist not that long ago, and it is the case that... <laughs> it is... It is, it is the case that we're, we're seeing um, a lot of jobs being destroyed and a lot of people being displaced by technological innovation. But at the same time, technological innovation makes it quite possible to radically improve the quality of a lot of the services you provide or of the re-education that, that you provide. I think the best way of dealing with disruptive innovation is not to stop disruptive innovation, which will actually re reduce productivity, but to harness that disruptive innovation to solve the problems it creates. And I think better training, better education is a classic example of, of how we can deal with these, these problems. Thank, thanks for that. Um, man here on the aisle. And then I'm going to try and get two, two more in after that. Uh, thanks for your thoughts. Um, so I see a lot of ideas about the, at the level of the state and the, you know, the size of the state and all that. It seems to me the, the majority of the problems we face now are very really global, and whether environmental um, resources, sort of society level. And isn't there an issue that the level of the states itself, the nation state, is almost becoming, I want to say irrelevant, but at the very heart of what the fourth revolution should do is an ability to walk across boundaries like that. So I'd like to have your thoughts on that, please. I think the answer is, I think there's an element of truth in what you say, is that, and you can certainly look at, yeah, we have a very live example here in terms of Scotland quite soon, um, that, that there is an element whereby nation states seem to work at a particular size. Um, there, as we pointed out, there are, there are lots of 
there are some problems that seem to work much better being dealt with locally than at, um, at, a ground, at a bigger level. One very interesting thing about the Scottish debate is if you look underneath the surface, the level to which the other parties have already promised huge amounts of devolution to Scotland in terms of what it can do in taxes and so on, there will be a change there anyway. Um, it, some problems, if you were sort of starting all over again, you're dead right, you, you can only deal with globally and the, the environment is the obvious one. And, and every now and again, there are strange ones. This, this isn't in the book, but you can look, actually, if you look at the UN, in some ways I would slim down the UN as well, but one of the things I would give the UN some kind of power to do is some sort of version of a standing army. The reason being that when you look at any of these peacekeeping problems or civil wars, actually getting some troops out there very quickly, a small number of troops, is, is fantastically useful. Global warming is another one which goes across boundaries. Oceans, a big subject of obsession with the economist is another one so there are these kind of global ones but on the against that you know na the national we're just about to see the world cup which is both a, an exhibit of globalism but also very much of people um dramatically supporting particular nations so i don't i don't really see the nation state thawing away and, and inside the european union the biggest experiment so far in something like that um you've seen a very sort of tough reinforcement of the of the state again but it's a good question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, there we go. Last, last ones, and some people have been very patient. Uh, gentleman in, in the hat at the back and um, in the center uh, here. Can we take those two together as we're really in the countdown? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping this might give you a punch at the end. Uh, I, I, I agree that I do expect another revolution, but I'm rather dubious about the methods by which you think it will come about. Um, you've suggested, for example, technology. Well, in the early 80s, we genuinely believed that by the end of the century, people would be able to work no more than three days a week. I'm not sure how many of us experience that today. You've talked about privatization, but the org when we contact senior leaders in major businesses, they express themselves, frankly, as baffled in how to run big companies. You've talked about big versus small, but you've acknowledged yourself that for more than a generation, and probably for generations, people have been talking about that question. So what I'd like to ask is, what element of your thinking do you think constitutes the mode of approach, the, the order of thinking that will actually constitute a real revolution and enable us not just to keep repeating the old problems all over again. Right, thank you for that. And very quickly, Ms. Under, do you have a microphone? Which I think um, the RSA needs for, yep, great. Thanks. Okay. Um, given the power of the media in shaping both people's um, perception of the state and expectation from it, you mentioned the Guardian and the Mail on differing sides. Uh, do you see it as a um, supportive force in the fourth revolution or a destructive one? Oh, interesting last question. <laughs> Ask Bromwin that. Um, the, 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 I'll, I'll, the, I'll, I'll try and do both on Edger and come in. I, yes, I mean, the, the, a lot of, if you look at these ideas, you look at revolutions when they've happened, this again is an attempt to answer the gentleman's question from back there as well. If, if, you, if you go back and look at the history of it, it's usually been a confluence of two things, a confluence of ideas and technology. It tends to be a sort of mixture between both. You had in the beginning of the 19th century, you had these liberal ideas about suddenly making people freer, about bringing more people into democracy, about a new commercial classes coming running through. But there was also quite a lot of technology, not just those new tech commercial classes. There was also the, the railway, which actually makes a dramatic difference to running a government. You no longer want to just hand over um, Northumberland to the Ridleys or to a family. You want to take it back. And you send professional civil servants there because you can send them up and down on the train. You can go and see how good they are. That, that makes, a, that, that makes a, a dramatic difference the way in which things work. So that combination of technology plus ideas is when you tend to get the momentum of these revolutions. In terms of a gentleman asking how this happens, it'll probably happen through a mixture of things. It could be a crisis, could be one prompt. It could be a, a, a leader going for things. A lot of it will be people like you. It'll be because we've talked a great deal about technology helping this thing about how you know, you'll be able to teach many more people, you'll be able to monitor healthcare remotely. That, that's all true. The real end of it will come from all of you actually looking online and seeing where your schools come, 
where your hospitals go. That, that is the bit which is already just beginning to happen. Is that 10 years ago, people, didn't know, people here didn't really know how bad our schools were compared with those in Finland, but those in Singapore, and now actually it turns compared with those ones in Poland. Because there weren't ways of looking online to work out exactly how bad they were. You can now go and look and compare your school in one area against the one next door. You can look at your hospital in Sweden and compare it with the one next door. It's that sort of bottom-up element which I think drives these things through. But behind most of it, there's an element of a big idea and there's technology. The technology is there. And I suppose what we're trying to do with this book is to re take people back to these big ideas, take them back to the questions about what actually you want to use the state for and push it through. I don't know what you want to say. I, uh, well, I'm comparing our progress against the clock, and we are, we are out, out of time. Adrian, really quick last word. No, as I, as I said, the fundamental thing is what is the state for? We've allowed that question to be answered by drift. We need to answer it through uh, intellectual clarity based on reading this book. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. And as you say, this is not an anti-state book. Um, I wish we could go on. There are a lot of hands up. A lot of you have been very patient in all blocks of the audience. My apologies for not being able to uh, get you all in. But I do urge you to come and qu keep quizzing them as they, as they sign books outside. Um, thank you for being a fantastic audience. Excellent questions ac across the whole uh, uh, range of, of subjects that this very provocative book brings up. Can you join me in thanking Adrian and John? Thank you.